there without the countdown, but uh, but a bit a view. Okay. So uh, we whoops, we just did this one. Uh, there is another version of this, by the way, where I show you how you can instead of writing this function that only generates a single calculates a single concentration at a time, it can do a vectorized thing where in this particular case it calculates the vector of predictions for each individual uh, in here. And I won't, won't actually go through that, but I, you know, it's there for you to look at to see how you can modify the same model but include a vectorized element in there. Uh, the next step is to talk a little bit about how you would program uh, the process of dealing with the event schedules, in particular dosing event schedules uh, <coughs> within here, uh, because that requires some additional programming effort on your part. In fact, I think the main reason I show this is to convince you that Torsten's a good thing, because once you use Torsten, you don't have to do this anymore. But, uh, but we'll briefly kind of go through uh, this process with an example. So we're going to deal with dosing and observation schedules. Let's assume our data format is a bunch of time-oriented event records for each individual, much like non-mem. Uh, and for each event time, I'm going to calculate the amount in each compartment given the compartment amounts plus doses at the previous event time. In other words, I'm going to do the, sort of the calculations recursively. So, you know, when you first take, so when you first start with an individual and say you give them a dose, uh, you know, and you then go to the next event and you're going to calculate the concentrations or the amounts in each compartment at that next time conditioned on the dose and anything from the <coughs> previous event. You keep on doing that over and over again. So basically at each time point you're sort of resolving the initial value problem where the initial values are whatever the values were at the previous event plus any doses you've had. Uh, now, the, one of the reasons for doing that is that it allows for things like time varying parameter values where may you allow the, where at a given event the parameters may change and so you can, uh, you can ha sort of have piecewise constant parameter values to deal with time variation in that. And again, that's very non-MEM like. Um, and that same approach works regardless of whether you've got a model that where you're calculating the uh, the predictions in terms of an analytic solution or a numerical solution. And for this, I'm going to use an example of some multivariate data here. So I've got multivariate PK with sort of sparse sampling in here. Uh, so this is saying we've got some sparsely sampled data uh, that resulted from the administration of something 200 milligrams every eight hours for five doses. Now, in this case, I'm going to use regular dosing intervals, but this would also work if they were irregular and different from subject to subject. So for this demo, I'm going to make it real simplistic. It's just going to be a one compartment model with first order absorption here. Uh, I'm going to do a uh, uh, you know, inter-individual variability in a population PK model, <coughs> just like we did in the last one, uh, a bunch of uh, priors here. Uh, in this instance, I use an example of where uh, maybe from previous, you know, well, sorry, restate. So with the sparse data, I know I don't have enough uh, data to characterize Ka in this case. Uh, but I do have prior data from, uh, you know, from the typical, you know, early phase one studies where they were more frequently sampled. And from that, I'm going to construct a, an informative prior for Ka. But I'm still going to let the sort of the data tell the story for the other ones and use weekly informative priors for the remaining parameters. Uh, in this example, uh, here is going to be called multi-dose PK1. Take a quick peek at that to show you sort of the process of that. So let's see, multi-dose PK1. Uh, yeah, right here. Uh, let's pull that up. Switch that out. Okay, so here I'm going to do a similar process to what I did before uh, and create uh, functions in, for uh, my <coughs> compartmental model here. Uh, the first function, actually remind myself which way I'm going to go with this. Okay. 
Uh, so the first function here is going to calculate the amounts in each compartment of my one compartment model with first order absorption. So I've got two compartments to worry about. So this, though I don't specify, recall I don't specify the, uh, uh, the dimensions, but we know we're going to generate two values in this case. Uh, and again, I'm only going to do that for one time at a time. Uh, the way I've written this one, the value here is not going to be the absolute time, but it's going to be the time relative to the previous observation. Thus, I call it dt instead of t. Uh, I'm going to have a vector of initial values. Those would be the values of the amounts in each compartment at, the, at well, whenever dt equals zero, basically which presumably would be the previous observation time. Uh, then I've got uh, an amount is going to take a, any new dose that gets put in, and that will be assigned to a particular compartment, which will be uh, the compartment specified by CMT. Uh, and I'm, notice I'm using very non-memish things here. Int here, or this int EVID, EVID is going to be like non-mem. In this case, I'm only going to, I think I only allowed one or zero uh, here, so it's either going to be one if it's a dosing event, zero if it's not. Uh, and then clearance, volume, and KA in this thing. Uh, so I go through here, uh, I'm going to want my return value is ultimately going to be that a vector of two values here, a temporary holder for that, so I'm going to call x. And then I've got, for my exponential court, uh, representation of this, it's going to be two exponentials, so i got two values of a and two values of alpha. Okay, it's one compartment model, so alphas are trivial. You know, it's either one of them's clearance over volume, the other one's ka. Uh, <coughs> I <laughs> initialize my x to a pair of zeros in here. And then I go through a process where given, um, uh, sorry, where I, I'm having to remind myself where I put amount in at this whole mess here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay. Um, okay, so given uh, whatever was in the compartment beforehand, uh, here I calculate the amounts in the two compartments in here. So here you can see I'm calculating the amount in compartment one, which is our absorption compartment, and that's just that single exponential, uh, e to the minus ka times dt here. And then for the, uh, for the central compartment, I calculate the corresponding uh, coefficients here, so you know my alpha two over alpha two minus alpha one, which is another way of saying ka over ka minus k, uh, and then the other a is just going to be minus that in here, and then again I calculate it, and again you see the sum of exponential term over here. Okay, and and that so this is making the calculation for. Uh, what's in compartments one and two given some initial amount in compartment one. Now I also have to allow for the possibility there may have been an initial amount in compartment two. And that's what goes on down in the next step over here. Now anything that was in compartment two in our classic two compartment one compartment model, uh, we usually only have a unidirectional arrow from our absorption compartment. So, so nothing goes back there, so I don't even have to calculate anything for compartment one. In compartment two here, I have to calculate uh, the, uh, sorry, I have to calculate uh, what the contribution of, is, of anything that was in compartment two at the start of that time interval. Add that to what I calculated from above here. Since it's a linear model, I can just superpose all of these things. And then finally, if I've given a dose at this time, in other words, if EVID equals 1, I increment that by that amount. Uh, notice I match them up to the appropriate compartment where that dose is going to go. Okay. And then I return that value. So that takes care of my basically solving my simple little you know, initial value problem. 
Uh, the next step here is to convert that to a, uh, a vectorized version of it. So that, keep in mind, the previous one is just calculating the amounts in those two compartments at a single time. Now suppose I pass in a vector of times uh, for a given individual, and I want to return the vector of predicted concentrations for that individual. I'm sorry, vectorized amounts. I'm going to do that, but of course, I've got each one, for each time I get two values, so I actually have to make this a, either a matrix or, a, or an array of vectors. I could do it one or either of those ways. In this case, I chose to do it a matrix. Uh, and if I remember correctly here, I've got to actually, rather than remember, let me make sure I actually have it straight. Uh, okay, come on guys, where'd it go? I'm trying to remember. Okay, so okay, so the rows correspond to the different times, and the columns correspond to the compartments. So it's going to be have two columns and a number of rows equal to the number of, uh, sorry, not number of subjects, number of observations within a subject. Okay, so so it's going to return a matrix value. On the right hand side, everything turns well. All of the all of the data elements turn into arrays. So you can see a real array for time, amount, and then integer arrays for compartment and, and EVID. In here, and then I've got you know just a single value for clearance VTA in here. And basically what I'm doing is just taking the previous function and sticking it in a loop to generate out to basically fill in this matrix across time. So it's just dealing with the rest of the bookkeeping around that. Yeah, so I'm doing things like, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be using this init value, which is basically you can always hold in, hold what the value is at one time to predict what's going to happen the next time. DT is going to contain the differences between the, those increments of time. Notice I'm, I didn't say this, but I'm assuming time is increasing in this, or I should say it's actually... Technically, it's non-decreasing. Uh, a matrix here that's going to hold our interim result before I send it back as a return value. In here, notice I'm using a handy-dandy function that's built in for how big something is. So here I, I know, so I can calculate the size of the value of the time vector that gets passed in uh, to determine what the, uh, the number of rows are. I use that again to generate this value, uh, size and time. Actually, if I wanted to be more concise, I could have actually stuck that in uh, as an argument there and used nt there and it would have been a little cleaner. Um, so I initialize my init to all zeros in here. I initialize my time and basically step through this process where, so I initialize that and so I start out with my first time. Uh, so actually, by default, this is always going to end. So the way, yeah, the way I set it up, it's going to be a zero. But that's good because that'll take care of anything like an amount being stuck in there on the first time. So it'll it'll appropriately do the calculation of the amounts in the compartments by adding in that that dose uh, for that first time in here. Uh, and then when it gets to the end, uh, you know, it then increments the time. <laughs> as we step through this whole thing. So that's all it's doing is it's just incrementing time and calculating the difference between uh, successive times and then for each one of those calculating the amounts in the various compartments and stuffing them in that uh, result matrix. So that's just a way of vectorizing that process. That's really about the only thing that ends up new here, I think. Let's see, just double check. Ah, okay. No, it isn't. The other thing I introduce in this one is the other way that I'll, that I'll be using in subsequent examples to deal with the ragged array that are in our data set. So where we may have different numbers of observations for each individual in here. Remember before I used that subject identifier that had to be an integer from one to however many subjects there are. Instead, what I'm going to do in this example is I don't have a subject identifier, 
what I do have is I pass in a couple of uh, integer arrays here that indicate where each individual's data starts and ends in my in my data set. Uh, so I've got so in my data set I'm going to have a bunch of equal length vectors here for various things like the amount, the compartment, and the EBID in there. And these two things, the, um, the start and end, are telling where in these arrays each subject's data begins and ends. And it turns out those are real easy to calculate in, in R before you pass it in. So I, you could do it internally here. Another way I sometimes do this is instead what I'll do is pass a uh, essentially an, an, I, what I often call an NTI value, which is the number of observations for each individual, and then calculate these inside of STAN, and that's easy to do too. So you can do it either way. In this case, I'm going to assume I did it in R, and I'm passing it in as data. Uh, let's see, anything else of interest in the data component? Uh, oh, yeah, another trick I'm going to be using in here. Uh, now, with, with a, in our typical pharmacokinetic data sets, we often have a mix of different kinds of observation events, or different kinds of events. We have observation events, and we have dosing events, and there may be other things in there where some, maybe some parameters change in there, but you have different kinds of events. And only some of them contain your dependent variable of interest. Okay, so I need some bookkeeping device to keep track of which ones do and which ones don't contain uh, dependent variable values. And I'm going to do that using these guys. So the total number of events I've got are going to be NT. But the number of events that contain observed values or dependent variables in here are going to be NOBS. So NOBS is going to be less than or equal to NT. And the and the indexes are corresponding to those uh, those events. I'm going to indicate by IOBS. So IOBS is a an array of uh, of integers that says which you know which of those NT events actually contain observed data. So that's going to be my trick for basically telling whether, say, in this case, whether it's a dose event or an observation event. Okay, so, so we're going to have that in there. What else? I think that's the end of the uh, bookkeeping elements in there. Another example. Let's see, we're getting bright over here. How, by the way, how readable is this now? I notice we'll get the light's getting brighter. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do? This is, uh, let's see, this is the same as before pretty much, except for, actually, why did I do that? Oh, okay, it's just, okay, that, I, it's something that's different with this that we don't have to deal with with Torsten, but uh, this is actually going backwards from the other way I said of specifying it. This is calculating the number of observations corresponding to each subject. And here, this NTI, which I uh, actually do I even use that here? Just a second, sorry for the complication. I'm not sure I use it. I have a feeling that's a vestigial bit that I forgot to get rid of. Sorry. I don't like mysteries like that, so oh, that's the wrong one here. Uh, okay. Why are my brains not working all of a sudden? Uh, yeah. Okay, I changed something I didn't intend to. There we go. Okay, I don't think I'm actually using that in this. That's why I was puzzling myself. NTI. Yeah, I think that was a vestigial bit. I think we can ignore that. Okay, so ignore NTI, I think. If we run across it, we'll know better. Uh, but the others we've seen before. I do my transformation to get it in terms of log concentration. 
By the way, again, not necessary. That's just because of the way I'm specifying the residual variability model. If you wanted to do sort of the classic thing of doing the mix between, to, if you wanted to be normal and use a mix of, you know, additive and proportional, there are ways to do that too. But this tends to be my favorite, so you're stuck with it. Anyway, um, so forget about NTI. Parameters, this is the same story as before. I don't think there's anything different, so let's go ahead and move right past that. Um, this is about the only thing that changes now, again, is we're going to be dealing with the fact that sometimes we're going to be interested only in things that correspond to observed, record, observed data records as opposed to those that are dosing records. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be having this intermediate calculation where I calculate the amounts in all the compartments, and then I, and then after that, calculate the concentration in the central compartment. Uh, and so, and that's here. I've sort of got that matrix here that corresponds to that same x we were doing up in the function. Uh, that's nothing new. This is same old, same old. Uh, we didn't, I didn't even bother with covariates in this one, so these are trivial uh, in here. Uh, and here's where things get different. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, now we are inside of a loop that goes over subjects. So J equals 1 to and however many subjects we have. And so I'm getting my individual parameter values here. And here's where I'm going to calculate the amounts in each compartment at each time for each subject separately. Uh, well, each subject part is a separate part. The times it does all of the times for each subject in one go. So notice here that my x, I'm, uh, I'm not specifying the, uh, any dimensions for the second argument. It'll, so it's going to so I know that I've got two columns here, and this is going to return two columns, so I don't have to do anything there. It'll just default to the two that are there. But for the, uh, but for the row component, I'm, I'm, pulling a, I'm slicing a chunk out of, out of this thing that corresponds to uh, where that individual's data begins and ends. And notice, by the way, I'm going to calculate this amount for all of the events, not just the observation events. Okay, so for the J subject, it's going to take where their stuff starts and ends. It's going to fill up that part of that matrix. And on the right-hand side, again, it's going to slice out the data for that J subject using that same set of values, that same... Notice, by the way, I guess we hadn't talked about the uh, syntax here, but that colon basically is, you know, is, is like R. It's R-like here, so it's... That means it's an integer. In this case, it's an integer vector anyway, going from start j to end j. Here, and it does that for all of our sort of, uh, in, you know, uh, independent variables here: time, amount, compartment, EVID, and then finally pulls out the individual parameters corresponding to the jth individual here for doing our calculations, and stuffs them in there. And then as a separate statement, okay, where my, there it is. As a separate statement, it's calculating the uh, expected value uh, of concentration for that individual. Again, I slice out an appropriate collection here, so it's going to calculate those concentrations, again, for all events, not just the uh, observation events. It takes the uh, amounts in compartment two, and divides them by the volume of distribution for that individual. So that's doing that. And then, and then another statement that I'm going to use here uh, in preparation for calculating the uh, likelihood is I'm going to extract out uh, the subset of these that correspond to observation events. So you remember this IOPS is that vector of uh, indices that correspond to the observed values uh, in here. So it just carves out that in a simple single statement. Uh, and then down in our model block, again, I do all my stochastic stuff. 
I've got all the priors specified in here. Notice this again illustrates sort of some of the flexibility around uh, around the particular approach we're using for the covariance matrix here. Notice I've got you know quite uninformative or very weakly informative priors for the omegas for uh, clearance and volume, but for Ka I use a, a fairly you know a more strongly informative prior here for that one. But I assume uninformative uh, in priors for the uh, correlation. <laughs> and finally, you've seen this before here, where we do the uh, the log theta given the uh, log theta hat here. <coughs> you know, I don't remember those. I used back up in the uh, in the uh, yeah, derived parameters block. And finally, I do the statement here where I'm doing the now again, this corresponds only to the records that have observed values to calculate my likelihood. Okay, so by the way, the main points I, in some ways I wanted to bring out on this is that doing the multiple dosing events involves a certain amount of bookkeeping that can be a bit tedious, uh, which is some of the things I'm going to try and uh, take. I'll take a subset of those off your shoulders with Torsten uh, as it is right now, and then when we develop those R packages, we'll take some of the rest of it off of, off of you, too. Okay, so this is actually about as much as I wanted to show here, just to show the process of doing multiple dosing in these things. And if you want to explore this further, the, you know, the corresponding R script is in here, which shows things like how do you calculate these start and end values and so on and pass them in. Again, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, in here. Those will actually we will use. I haven't taken that part, some of this off your shoulders yet with Torsten. Uh, you'll still have to do some of that bookkeeping, but what you don't have to do essentially is write the functions that we've got up the top. Okay, so where I wanted to go next is talk about uh, dealing with systems of ordinary differential equations. Uh, so, you know, when we get into cases where, you know, where you either don't have an analytic solution or you don't want to program the whole thing uh, and you want to take advantage of the fact that you can easily write the uh, differential equations, uh, there are some tools in STAN that let you do that. Let's start out with the uh, sort of the, the simpler case, which is what happens if you have a model that's written in terms of a system of linear ordinary differential equations, specifically a system where it's, uh, it's linear ODEs with constant coefficients, or at least piecewise constant, anyway. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, it's more efficient to use a matrix exponentials to solve that rather than using the multi-step methods uh, that we'll be using for the more general case. And that is available to you. In particular, there's a function in STAN called matrix underscore EXP. Uh, and we can thank uh, uh, a colleague who was with us for, I guess we had Charles for a couple of years. Charles Margosian put that together. Uh, for us, and it subsequently has been contributed to STAN itself here. So it calculates a matrix exponential here where A is a square matrix. It uses something called a Pate approximation with scaling and squaring uh, as the algorithm. Uh, and our typical pharmacometrics use case is going to be one where we have a model uh, where, it, again, it's a linear system of ODEs. It's got constant coefficients. And in that case, you can express the, uh, you can express the, the thing in terms of like here where you've got, you know, the derivative basically dx dt equals kx where x is a vector and k is a matrix. And here in particular it's a square matrix. Uh, and, and you've got initial conditions here that I've written out as x at t0 equals some x0, some set of values. Uh, so in that, when that's the case, you can write out the solution, like you see here, where you've got a matrix exponential term where the exponent is this uh, 
the difference from basically the time difference from baseline times that rate constant matrix uh, is so so that that's a matrix itself you, you use the matrix exponential there multiply it times the initial conditions and that gives you the solution to that differential equation so that means we could take a case where uh, well, this is a case. Actually, it's not too hard to write the analytical solution to this one, but you know, I'm lazy and it's quicker to just write it out as a matrix exponential, so I'm doing that here. But it illustrates the process. But you can imagine this could be substantially more complex. You know, you have might have a much larger scale model uh, where uh, it's not so easy to solve uh, solve it analytically, and it and it might very well be one where you could only sort of do it semi-analytically because you might have to do something like, you know, solve a, you know, uh, you know, a poly, you know, a polynomial, you know, of order 10 or something. Uh, so anyway, this could take care of that. So in this case, I'll just do a good old two compartment model with first order absorption and an effect compartment. Uh, so when I do that, I can write that out in terms of that matrix. Uh, of that matrix equation here, where the K you can see written out here. You know, you've got basically the first three rows correspond to our two, two compartment model with first order absorption, and the last row they, describes our effect compartment component. So I can write it that way. My concentration in my central compartment is just going to be x2 over v1, and my effect compartment will be x4 over v1, and I threw in a, you know, I just a Emax model here, uh, just to illustrate this for my uh, pharmacodynamics. So, so we've got a little delay in here. So let's imagine we've got something like this, where I've got plasma concentrations here, uh, which I'm going to describe in terms of that two-compartment model. I've got some effect over here, which shows some delay relative to the plasma concentrations. You can see that in the hysteresis plot on the right. And here, so we could write out a model to, to deal with that case uh, in Stan. I can see that's in something called effect, you know, F compartments, single patient. Uh, for a simple example here, so so let's go back to our model thing here. So where is it? F compartment, single patient. There it is. Boom. Okay, so. The, a lot of stuff is not terribly interesting in here. Um, <coughs> what was I doing? Okay, where did I want to show this? Yeah, the main part I want to bring out, yeah, here it goes, is down here. In my trans, the new part here is in my transform parameters block. Uh, like before, I'm going to initially calculate the amounts in all of the compartments in here, and that's the reason why I've got this matrix here. That I'm showing as n obs four, so it's going to have four columns corresponding to the different compartments in this model. Uh, my ray constant matrix is going to be contained in this four by four matrix. Uh, in here, I initialize my matrix. And by the way, you'll see there's a lot of functions like this inside Stan that you can use to rapidly uh, assign values uh, to various kinds of objects. So like rep matrix basically says, you know, fill up this matrix with this value for, you know, however many rows and columns. So this on the, so that's specifying a four by four matrix of all zeros. Uh, and then I go through and I fill in the non-zero elements of that matrix in here, so I just step through it one by one. You know, I've got K11 is minus Ka, 21 is Ka, and so on. Uh, so that's that same matrix we saw on the, on the slide. And then this statement here is essentially the same statement you saw where, you recall it was like, you know, x equals, uh, you know, e to the t minus t0 times k, all times x0. Well, that's the same setup here, except so I'm grabbing the ith record, the ith observation, 
and I do the matrix exponential. Now my t0 is 0, so I just do, so it's just t minus t0 is just t, basically, times, times my matrix, excuse me, matrix k. And my initial values here, in this case, I'm putting dose in the absorption compartment, and all the rest are zeros. And I actually, this is more complicated than I needed to make it, but we'll tell you that in a second. The uh, braces, the open, so you can see I've got open brace, dose, zero, 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 closed brace. That would be, that's an array literal uh, in, in STAN. So that's specifying an, uh, a real array containing, you know, dose, zero, zero, zero. And then, because of this multiplication of a matrix times a vector, uh, well, it requires a vector type over here instead of an array type. I convert that to a vector. In addition, uh, it needs to be a, is that right? Uh, I'm trying to, let's see, where the com, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's right. So, by the way, this whole thing is in parentheses here. Uh, it turns out that when I did that, my matrix was the other way around from where I wanted it, so I had to do a transpose, and that's what this little, the prime is, uh, is a, or the single quote, uh, is a transpose function in here, because this actually, the matrix was the other way around. I suppose I could have written it in the first place that way. Now, it turns out the two vector with the array uh, since I first wrote this, they've added in vector literals, too. Vector literals, instead of using braces, use square brackets. So I could have actually just used square brackets there instead, and that, that would have done the job without the two-vector statement, which converts the array to a vector. Uh, and the rest of this is just familiar kind of stuff, you know, where I'm calculating the predicted concentration central effect compartment, and then my, uh, uh, the equation for my response in here. Uh, so it's just the Emacs model. Okay, but the new stuff here is mainly this guy right here. So that's an example of dealing with a simple linear uh, system of ODEs. Now let's get to, uh, well, I guess I, we don't need to go through those other slides because they're the same thing I just showed you. And if you wanted to see a picture of the results here, that's just what, what the fit looks like in this case. Uh, so what if <laughs> we have a more general differential set of differential equations, uh, which may be nonlinear, something that can't be put in that. Uh, matrix exponential form. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, ODE solvers uh, in STAN, and shortly there will be at least one more. Um, uh, so there's the two that are in there right now is one uses a, uh, the first one here is you can see called Integrate ODE RK45. That uses what's called a runga kutta dopery fourth, fifth order algorithm uh, using, well, one of the commonalities you'll often see inside STAN is rather than write all things de novo where they can, they will derive things from available open source libraries. So they use something from Boost in here. And that's suitable for non-stiff differential equations. Uh, and then they also implemented a backward differentiation formula method here and that's the name of the function is integrate ODE BDF, uh, and that uses an implementation from the Sundials collection uh, in here, and that's designed for stiff ordinary differential equations. Uh, another one that should come out, I think, in the next version of STAN, you'll, it'll pro I forget what name they use. I, I think it might have been integrate ODE AM, which will be using uh, one that uses an adams moulton method, which is also from the Sundials collection. It's, it's for non-stiff uh, equations, but it sometimes has some advantages over Runga Kutta, so that will be available in there too. Uh, they use the same basic structure, as you can see here. Uh, they all return a... Uh, actually, do I, I think I described this better in subsequent slides. Yeah, 
I'm, rather than spend a lot of time on the signature, let me go to the next slides here. So, but they each have the same kind of signature uh, in here. Uh, to use these, the user has to, in the function block, has to specify uh, a system of ordinary differential equations using a function that has this signature. So it has to return a real array. Uh, now, in the case where it's a single differential equation, it's a real array, but it's a real array with one element, but it, it would still be specified as an array. Uh, the name can be whatever you want. Uh, I just wrote ODE simply here, uh, where it has a, uh, a value for, why am I, yeah, that's correct, okay. So it's got a time, that's a real scalar. Uh, then you have a real array, uh, you know, we're calling it state, and that would be, uh, that would be the values of the different components. So in a compartmental model, those would be the amounts in the different uh, compartments in there. Uh, but that would basically be the values of the, uh, of, anyway, each of the states in there. Uh, you have a vector of parameter or a real array of parameter values. Uh, so one of the things that you'll find with this is that you may have the parameters as separate objects, but at some point you're going to have to pack them up into a single uh, real array to pass them into this. Also, again, recall that STAN, again, strongly types things between whether they consider something data which is not supposed to ever get changed versus parameters, uh, which you're trying to estimate. So if you're passing things in which are data, which shouldn't, which you're not trying to estimate, it's most efficient to pass them in not through theta, but through these other things. Here we've got a uh, array of, uh, of real values or an array of integers. So if you have data, you pass them in through those instead. So there's a little bit of bookkeeping when you play with those. Um, and I guess I, did I yeah, pretty much said all of those things. Uh, the solvers themselves have this, uh, this signature. So the value that the return value is going to be a, a real a two-dimensional real array in here, which is basically going to return uh, 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 let's see, I always got to keep these straight, uh, make sure I get the columns and I always get my columns and my rows mixed up. Uh, I'll correct this later if I've mixed it up here, but I think the, uh, I think the columns correspond to the different states and the rows correspond to the different times. I'll correct that later if I got that backwards. Uh, so for example, if you have a set of system of differential equations that has four differential equations. That means it's got four states corresponding to those equations. There would then be four columns, and the number of rows would correspond to however many times you pass is that third argument here. I guess technically a fourth argument uh, where it says real times. So the first argument here is the function that, you're, that you have to create that contains your differential equations. Then you have uh, a real array that, that provides the initial conditions, in other words, the initial values of all the states, uh, as well as the, the next one is the initial time here, and then the subsequent one <coughs> where it says a real array of times, that's all the subsequent times. Uh, one frustration sometimes with, this fun with these functions is the first time cannot be the same as the initial time. And that sometimes forces a little bit of bookkeeping on you. Uh, the real array theta is our parameters again. And then we have our, you know, our data components, the xr and the xi, if you're going to pass any data values in. It also has some additional things for controlling the solvers. Uh, it allows for you to pass a relative tolerance, an absolute tolerance, and a maximum number of steps to use in the solver. Of course, those are somewhat different for the different solver types. Uh, I actually need to double check these, these uh, to see if these defaults are still hold, but I believe they do. Uh, the defaults for relative tolerance and absolute tolerance are 10 to the minus 6, and 10 to the 6 for maximum number of steps. 
you may want to change those depending upon the specifics of your case. You know, if you happen to be working with situations where the predicted value, you know, where the calculated values are on the order of 10 to the minus 6, you probably want an absolute tolerance that's a bit smaller, for example. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, asking for a relative tolerance of 10 to the minus 6 for some problems may just be too demanding. In some cases, not demanding enough. So, so those are things you may have to play with for any specific cases. And I got to remember, I believe those are also those last three are also optional arguments. If you want to just accept the defaults, you can just not specify them at all. So just to illustrate this, let's take another example. Uh, in this case, we'll take an indirect action PKPD model that can't be written in terms of the uh, matrix exponential. Uh, so I'm going to use, in this case, some uh, simulated plasma fluid ion concentrations and INR measurements, so international normalized ratios is a measure of the coagulation. And, uh, and I'm going to use that following a 20 milligram dose of fluid ion in just a single individual. Keep our life simple. So again, we've got our plasma concentrations, our INR values you can see are kind of pushed off to the right compared to the observed concentrations. And then again, you get a, some sort of a hysteresis going on in this case. But instead of using a uh, effect compartment model, we're going to be describing this in terms of a uh, indirect action model. So in our uh, model here, it's going to be we're going to do the usual two compartment model with first order absorption. So that eats up our first three components here. And then for our indirect action model here, we have our fourth, um, uh, our fourth uh, differential equation. I've just got K in, so we're going to put the effect on the input in our indirect action model. So you can see our K in times 1 minus E drug minus a, a K out times our, the amount in that compartment. And the X4 in this is that it's not going to be I and R itself, but the reciprocal of I and R. Um, and, I'll, and, you know, we can, we can blame that on France, so she did that, so. And so, so, anyway, so we've got the sigmoid E max model stuck on that. But the main point I want to show is how you implement this part of it. Um, oh, yeah, okay, I forgot about that. Okay, so another issue here that I'm going to, the way I'm going to deal with it in this case is dealing with a non-zero initial condition on INR. Uh, the approach I'm going to use in this uh, is I'm going to use a change of variable. There's two ways I could do this, but this is the one I'll use. I'm going to use a change of variable. So instead of that x4, which is the 1 over INR, I'm going to use the uh, change, the difference from baseline in that x4. Uh, is going to be the quantity I'm going to use in my differential equation. And here I've just rewritten that last equation in terms of that, uh, in terms of that transform variable in here. And we've got our uh, residual variable variability models in here, a couple of log normal things going on in that. And that just, the last thing is just showing the INR calculation relative to that delta 4 value uh, variable that I'm using. And I won't even agonize over the uh, priors on this one since that's not our focus here. So this is going to be in a model called fluid ion 1. And that's going to be right here. Okay, so first thing we have to do is take that set of differential, that set of four differential equations and pack them in to a uh, into a function which fits the requirements of the ODE solvers that are built into uh, built into Stan. Uh, so you can see here I've just I've given it a name, fluid ion ODE. Uh, again, it's you know returns a real array and takes as arguments a scalar for time and then real arrays for everything else here. And I go through my usual two-compartment model hoo-ha at the beginning. 
uh, add in the elements and here. It gives us a bunch of declarations that I'm adding in for all of the model components in here, as well as my initial value for that INR, uh, which is going to be an estimated quantity, thus I'm passing it in as a parameter. Uh, this is going to hold my intermediate value for my derivatives here. I just call it, this is not a, a reserve name. You can call it whatever you want. I just happen to call it DXDT. Uh, you know, and then I've got a thing for the concentration and an e-drug, some intermediate holders there. Um, I'm going to, oh, I call, I just realized, just to point out, notice I didn't call it theta here for whatever reason. I tend to call it PARMS. That's the same thing as what was called theta when we were talking about the original definition. And so it means somewhere before calling this, I have to have packed all of these parameters into <laughs> this you know, this array of values that, are, that I've called this, that I've called parms. So you can so here I'm extracting them from that package, if you like, in here to get all those elements out that I need to do my to calculate my ODEs, and then I go through that. I do the usual things for my two compartment bits here. Um, you know, we've got our usual K in and K out stuff in here for my uh, indirect action model. Uh, I go through, I calculate uh, my uh, DXDTs here, my derivatives for my for the PK compartments in here. Uh, I calculate my concentration is X2 over V1. Uh, this is a comment. Um, when you're working with ODE solvers, uh, numerical ODE solvers like this, you may know that this quantity is supposed to be non-negative, but the ODE solver doesn't. ODE solvers are stupid things. You know, they just go ahead and calculate things using these iterative calculations, and if the number that's not supposed to be negative, uh, you know, becomes negative, it could care less. So you have to sometimes bulletproof the code a bit to avoid those. Uh, if that's going to be a problem uh, for your functions. And, and often in a sampling scheme, like where this is all embedded inside of this random sampling strategy, uh, that can often cause all kinds of cruel injustices as you're going through these. So anyway, so uh, at various places, you'll see me putting little bulletproofing code. And this would be an example of that. F max is just a max, is just a thing for taking a maximum, uh, two, maximum of two real values. Uh, so this says, okay, and basically what this is saying is if x2 over v1 is negative, make it zero. So, so it forces this to be uh, non-negative. Uh, for one thing, these calculations often do nasty stuff if, if that thing's negative. So, uh, so anyways, and then I do my sigma e max model here, which I need for the next step, which is to go through and calculate my... Uh, my differential equation for my uh, for my indirect action compartment in here. So that's what's going on here. And a reminder: the x4 inside here is that delta four thing I called in the you know, in the slides. So that's that's the work you need to do to just specify the differential equations. And then, okay, data is nothing special here. That's all old stuff. Um, Maybe point out something here. In this case, I wasn't passing any data elements into my differential equations. So uh, for the objects I have to pass into my solver, I just declared them as empty arrays. So you can get away with this. You can actually specify uh, arrays with no elements. You could actually put elements in there. It probably wouldn't hurt either. But you can get away with specifying them as, as empty in here. So I've got my number of compartments in here. What have I got? Oh, here I went ahead and uh, generated a quantity here. Uh, my init here, which is going to contain my initial values in here. So again, I'm going to put a dose in the first compartment and nothing in the rest. Um, what else here? OK, these are just dealing with the transformations for the uh, dependent variables. Uh, let's see, most of this is just standard declarations, nothing too exciting there. Uh, yeah, and those are the parameters that you'd be specifying priors for, as well as initial estimates. 
And for, okay, in our transform, this is where we're going to do some of our work. Uh, I guess the main thing I'm going to bring out, so remember that I can't, like, have my own, sig my own private signature and pass in Clarence V1 and all those as arguments directly. I have to pack them up inside of this uh, theta or parms component. So that's what I'm doing here. I declare my parms as a 10 element array here. And then I just pack everything I want in it in the order I want it in. And you have to, you, that's bookkeeping you have to keep track of because the order here is the same order you're going to be assuming when we wrote the differential equation up on top. So this to me is one of the easier ways to do it. I just use my old brace here for uh, specifying what amounts to a, uh, uh, well, sort of like an array literal, except I guess in this case it's not literal because I'm passing parameters in it. Okay, so we pack them all up, uh, and then down here, uh, I go through the calculation. So uh, recall I said one little tedious bit is the first time here cannot be the initial time. It has to be something after that. Uh, so to calculate the first x here, that's just going to correspond to my initial estimates anyway, so I just make that assignment, and then in this step, I just go from 2 to mt instead of from 1 to mt here. And so, and so in one go, I'm actually going to be calculating the values for all the times, not just for the, not, not each time separately. And that makes sense because a solver kind of increments through these things anyway, so it's more efficient to do it that way. Uh, so I'm going to use the Runga Kutta fourth fifth order method. Uh, the the signature for the BDF method would look to, would be the same except replacing this with BDF. And uh, what can I say about it? Not much more to say um, on this here. I well I use the defaults for the tolerances, but I allowed it somewhat more for the uh, number of steps in here. Uh, and it just goes through and does the solutions and passes the values back for the amounts in the compartments at all the times. And here I just operate on that to calculate the corresponding predicted concentrations and I and R values in here. I don't think there's, yeah, I think that that would be it on sort of the new elements in this. Real itch there. Okay. So. The bookkeeping increases. Pardon? The bookkeeping increases, right? Yeah. But but it's good to have this as an example because what I sense, I think, I, think, I hope this will be for more, otherwise I um, need to um, publish something. But I, I will not be able to uh, replicate this for my own problems if I don't have an example like this. Mm -hmm. This is, this is good to look through. Yep, and, and then we'll also see it. Some of the elements of the bookkeeping torsion will take off your shoulders, some of it it won't. And we'll see that. Okay. Typical, um, error, yeah. If you, if you go this, and what are typical error messages that we can see, and how do you solve them? What, what are <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, uh, the one good thing I will say from being a past user of WinBugs is uh, Stan folks have been much better at generating informative messages. It's not perfect, but it's way better than, uh, than that was. And it's way, and they're generally way more informative than telling you the, uh, you know, the, whatever the likelihood is minus infinity or whatever. Um, you know, which is going to swipe it on them. But, anyway. <laughs> uh, but, but it generally, they're pretty good. Uh, in fact, part of the problem is sometimes it's almost too verbose because there's also a lot of messages that are benign that you can ignore. Um, maybe when we get to the sort of the formal hands-on elements, we might sort of go through those because I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Okay in these because one of the things you can run into of course is it may fail you know the solver itself may fail 
to converge at, at a given iteration because it couldn't meet the tolerance conditions within the specified limits of this. Um, and maybe a just general comment with ODE models is sometimes a sampler like this will wander off into a space that can, can create a very ill-conditioned set of ODEs that are very hard to solve, if not impossible. And so one of the problems that you sometimes find is that it, it may get stuck somewhere off in the ether. That doesn't happen as much as it used to. They've improved on that. But, you know, but if you end up where it tries to sample something in a really bad part of the space where uh, where the ODE solver is like really, really grossly stiff in some strange way. You know, maybe it's got a point where there's essentially a singularity because of where it's wandered to. Uh, you know, it may sit there for a long time before it finally hits one of these limits and tells you something's wrong, and at which point it will just cut it off. You know, it'll give up at that point. Uh, so those are things you, with, that are unique to ODE is that it, it can struggle more with that, especially if you've picked, if you think you've got something which is non-stiff, and it may well be non-stiff in most of the meaningful part of the posterior, but it may try to work in spaces that are not part of the, you know, part of that meaningful part of the posterior, and it may struggle. So if you get into that, you know, you have to consider things like uh, bulletproofing it a bit more, maybe using tighter constraints uh, on some of the parameters. And of course, you'll have to think whether that makes sense given that. There's also things we'll look at uh, in terms of specifying some, uh, some things that prevent the, uh, the sampler from wandering too far afield. You can actually specify some of the parameters of the HMC sampler uh, that will help constrain that somewhat. Uh, you know, and finally, also making choices like even though over most of the posterior, it may make sense to use something for a non-stiff solver because of the fact it may wander off into other spaces where it does get stiff, you may have to resort to the stiff solver, the BDF solver. And fortunately, the most recent iteration of the BDF solver has become more efficient. Uh, and I didn't comment on that. The Runga, if it's non-stiff, the Runga Kutta solver will be faster. But if it is stiff, it's likely the stiff solver will be faster uh, in this thing. So you kind of have to make that trade off in here. Yeah. So I was just going to ask, um, it looks like you could pop in your own solver here. You want to use also the for instance to automatically switch? Uh, not easily. Not easily, okay. Uh, there, there's a lot going on under the hood of these solvers in order to deal with the fact that one of the things that we'll talk a little more about as we look at the sampler itself is not only does, in the HMC, not only do you need to calculate the function values, but you have to calculate the gradients with respect to all the parameters. Yeah, the C-bodes. Oh, okay. The C-bodes in there. Pardon? Is that why it's using C-bodes? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and in, you know, but in both cases, it in effect uses an augmented set of ODEs in order to deal with that, in order to get that. and so. There's a significant amount of work you would have to do to put in your own solver, more than just kind of plugging it in. And when it when it does fail in integration, does it kill the chain, or does it just uh, it, reject the sample? Well, it'll kill it. I generally it kills the chain. Okay. Excuse me, Bill. You were mentioning that you could change some of the sampler settings. Mm -hmm. Can we come back to those settings later on? Yeah, some of them. There's a whole slew of them that you can play with, but we'll look at a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where was I going to go to next here? So keep an eye on where we are. Okay. Uh, and just be lunch, I guess we decided it was around 12.30, so I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, next step here. So I was going to talk a little bit about Torsten, which is a, which is a metrum-centered project. And I guess I didn't really talk, you know, because I was kind of assuming some background in Stan, but just a reminder, Stan itself is a, is a project whose uh, the, sort of the main folks in there are that started that development are Columbia University. That's still where sort of the core developers are, but there's also a number of uh, major contributors 
in other locations on this. And I guess since we were just talking about ODEs, I should probably cite uh, Sebastian Weber in particular. As an, uh, he's at Novartis, who's done, who is a major contributor when it comes to putting together the ODE solvers uh, for, uh, for Stan. Uh, but anyway, there's a number of other folks out there uh, that are contributing uh, to that. So it's an open source project. You know, uh, our contributions are, meaning Metrum contributions to Stan so far, have been relatively small. Uh, you know, we've added in a, uh, some functionality like the matrix exponential, and there's uh, an algebraic solver for dealing with solutions of systems of algebraic equations as opposed to differential equations uh, as part of it. And then Torsten is sort of a separate package that's kind of an add-on to Stan uh, that we did at Metrum. Okay, uh, let's take a look at Torsten. Okay, so Torsten is a set of functions. Essentially, it's a set of functions that do some of the kinds of things we were just, that I showed you for dealing with uh, um, calculating, you know, PK and PKPD outcomes given a, an event schedule. Uh, so it provides functionality, which I'd say is similar to non-MEMS PredPP library. Uh, it's core functions at the moment. Uh, so we've got our one and two compartmental compartment PK models with first order absorption, which uses analytic solutions uh, for those to calculate them. And here I've just shown, and we'll talk a bit more about the signatures in a subsequent slide, but you, uh, all of the signatures have a lot of commonalities here. Then we've got uh, one for dealing with linear compartmental models where the user specifies a rate constant matrix uh, as that for that. Uh, and then the more general case that uses those same two solvers we just looked at internally, but also deals with the sequence of, of, of events that we commonly encounter, like dosing events, and deals with the bookkeeping on that. And there's a few other things in there. Um, now nah, we'll leave it. This is the core, and that we'll, we'll focus on that. Uh, the name, by the way, we're sort of trying to follow the theme of you know, Stan was named after Stanislaw Ulam. So who do we name ours after that's kind of like Stan? Well, I guess you could argue that uh, a person who might be labeled as sort of a, you know, a, a father of pharmacokinetics would be Torsten TRL, and thus Torsten. And that's where, where the name comes from. Uh, you can see like this actually cites an article from 1937, so that goes back a little ways on that. So that, that's the reason for the name. And also, I guess, sort of starts the tradition of uh, pharmacokinetics at, uh, at, uh, at Uppsala. OK, so for those Torsten functions in there, there we're using sort of non mem -pred pp conventions for data specification uh, and how we're handling the events. Uh, the data format is a set of time-ordered event records in each individual, much like non-MEM. Uh, the implemented non-MEM data types include time, you know, compartment amount, rate, EVID, II, ADDL, and SS. Uh, it uses recursive calculations under the hood, much like PredPP and the example I was showing you before. Uh, and that, again, allows for time-varying uh, parameter values in the sense of them being piecewise constant. Uh, the current version of Torsten, I give you the site that, uh, is available uh, at this location. It's hosted on GitHub, uh, which, by the way, means if anybody's dying to contribute to Torsten, uh, this does provide you with the option of that. It's also a place where you have problems to Torsten, you can go in there and, uh, and post an issue in there, and that will be visible to us to try and resolve. Uh, yeah, that includes installations, instructions that you can use either with our stand, like we're going to be using here, or there's also a command line version of STAN uh, called Command STAN, uh, and it provides instructions for either. Uh, it's got some documentation in there, which is also, I mentioned this manual, the Torsten manual is also in the stuff I put in the uh, course materials on the website there. So as an illustration, let's, we're going to return to that, that multi-dose PK-1 example. 
but we're going to do it using torsten. Instead, uh, so this is again, the, I think this is, I believe this is the identical data set. Uh, the model is the same again. The only difference is the way we're going to implement it. We're going to use the torsten function instead of trying to write out the function ourselves. And so instead of calling it multi dose PK1, it's now called multi dose PK1 torsten. Um, and let's take a peek at that. Okay, I seem to have two different kinds here. I forget what they are. Let's take a peek. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, not the one with the two on it, it's the other one. I think I need to close. I got too much crap going on here. Get rid of some of these things. <clears throat> okay, let's go back. Okay. Okay, why are you not? There it goes. Okay, so this is going to look, a lot of it's going to look kind of similar to what we had before. Now, keep in mind, this one. This was just a two compartment model. Actually, was it two or one? Now that I said that. And it's a one compartment model. Okay, I had to remember what that was. Okay, so this was our, our one compartment model with first order absorption, and we're going to get and we're giving oral doses in here. So much of the stuff is going to look the same as what we had in the previous example. Uh, even the data set, except for a few items here. Uh, so <coughs> I still do the bit. I specify how many subjects and the total number of events. I still have to deal with the bookkeeping uh, related to the fact that some of the events are observations and some are not. In this case, it's either observations or dosing events. Uh, and so I still, I still have this NOBS and IOBS thing uh, to deal with that bit of bookkeeping. Uh, I, so uh, the rest of, a lot of the rest of this, okay, going from this amount down to SS is basically like passing the row in uh, a non-mem data set, uh, except instead of passing it as a single uh, data frame, I, have, I pass it as a set of equal length arrays. And here, uh, so and you can see the usual names and they're defined the same way as they would be for non-mem. Uh, I still have to deal with my ragged arrays because my right now the torsten functions are set up to do one patient at a time. So they'll deal with all the observations for a single patient, but it's still one patient at a time. Uh, the, the work for dealing with multiple patients will ultimately go in that R package, I keep promising. Uh, so we've got the same thing with start and end, and again, we've got our times and our here and our observed concentrations. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the idea of having uh, boundaries on the data? Is that a data check implicitly? Yeah, well, yeah, when you put, yeah, in fact, I can co quickly comment on that. Uh, having constraints in data is handled in a sense different than it is in in parameters. So in data, it's basically just a runtime check. So when you run it, if any of the data you put in doesn't isn't consistent with that, it basically stops the run and says, hey, your data doesn't match the constraints you've set here. So that happens once right at the beginning, uh, as opposed to anything in the parameters where you specify it, it's checking that all the time, you know, with each iteration. Okay, transform data. What did I do in transform? Okay, the same thing here. I've done that before. I transform the data to log transform. Um, just specifying some dimensions in here that I basically these are just used as uh, dimensions in some of the declarations later, like number of random effects, number of compartments, and number of parameters uh, that are going to get passed to my torsten function. Uh, oh, in this case, okay, in addition to having all of the usual parameters in there, I've also got, you know, Fs and T lags in here for this 
Uh, since in this particular case, I'm not estimating either one of them, I'm actually specifying them uh, using the default values inside the, uh, inside the transform data block. Uh, because I'm not estimating them, I should specify them as data because they're going to remain fixed, and I'm specifying all the Fs as 1 and all the T lags as 0. If you're going to estimate them, you would want to declare those in the parameters block. And you wouldn't assign values there. They would, that would happen indirectly through the priors. Okay, and then in parameters, uh, in here I've got, the, we've seen this before here, I've got my usual uh, typical values in here. I'm using the same thing. I've got my uh, LKJ for the uh, correlation, and I, you know, in here, and I'm specifying the inter-individual standard deviations. And this is where I'm going to hold my ind my individual level things in this thing I call log data. So other than adding a bunch of comments here, it's more or less the same thing. By the way, this when I wrote this, I was deliberately trying to annotate it more than I had some of the other examples. Uh, so you can also use it for a little self-learning that way. Um, yeah, so in transform parameters here, yes, uh, you're getting my theta hat here, uh, which here I decided to go ahead and do the assignment right in the, in the declaration statement. So you can see I packed up the clearance, clearance hat, V hat, and KA hat into that theta hat because I have to use, I could, by the way, I could have, I probably shouldn't even go through these could haves, but I could have actually just done that right in the multivariate normal statement and not even had an intermediate one there. Uh, okay, and then we're just declaring for the individual parameter values. Covariance matrix, all of this is actually you've seen before. In there, uh, just declaring for my predicted values here, both the, for all of the events and for the subset of uh, events where we have observed values. Uh, this we saw when we did the uh, calculations before where I have a place that holds the amounts in each compartment uh, at, all the, at the various times in the different compartments. And then this thing is this PARMS array is just used to, that's again going to be the thing where I package stuff to pass to the, uh, to, to the Torsten function in this case. So Torsten still suffers that same, actually, what did I, is that true? Where was I going with this? Actually, I, was, I think I was just, excuse me for a moment while I figure out why I even bothered with PARMS. hate it when I forget why I did something. Did I pull up? No, this is the right one. Oh, yeah, it is that way. I forget. I'm sorry. You know, brain fart for a moment there. Maybe it's a senior moment. Uh, because I do all of these functions. That right now, the way uh, the functions are set up, for tourists, and it still uses that strategy where you pack up everything in a single array for all of the parameters, and so they so you have to pack them up that way, uh, as opposed to because one of the possibilities that uh, we went through is do we instead for you know with a one compartment model and a two compartment model, well you know exactly what the parameters are because you could actually specify them as arguments separately, uh, but that expands the number of arguments which is already large in here, which is kind of messy. Uh, so the decision was instead to pack them up in, in this way, particularly because when we get to the more general ones for the models specified in terms of user-specified ODEs, you can't do that anymore because there is no unique set of parameters for each one. Anyway, sorry. So anyway, so I've got the PARMS thing that I pack everything up in. Okay, we do our inter-individual calculations. That's all the same. Here again, I'm packing up my parameters. And for this, for the one compartment, two compartment model, uh, there is a required specification there because this is all you write. You don't have another function where you can unpack these. 
So they're in a, so for the one compartment and two compartment model, uh, PARMS has to contain a, uh, the parameters in a specific order, which in this case is clearance, volume, and Ka. Uh, there are separate arguments for, whoops, flew too fast, for F and T lag. So those you pass as separate things. So PARMS F and T lag is the full collection of parameters. Though again, in this case, I've passed F and T lag as data because I'm not estimating them. So I just put in the default values. So, but this is the basic thing here. So, and all of our torsion functions look more or less the same way with little bits of variation in the argument list for the different cases. Uh, so, and this is the way I've most often used it, is inside of a loop. Where'd it go? Yeah. Looping over subjects. I go through, uh, I package up the individual parameter estimates into PARMS and then call the torsten function. And I'm using, again, that start and end approach to deal with the ragged arrays. And then once I've done that, so again, the return values in terms of the amounts in all the compartments, and then you can do with those amounts whatever you wish. Uh, now, I remember that we also went through the debate, do I just return the concentration? Because that's the most common thing people do. Uh, but I figured there's bound to be cases where you want to do something else. So to keep it general, I set it up where it's always turning the amount, returning the amounts. And then the user has the choice of doing whatever they want to with those amounts. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to calculate my concentrations by taking the amounts in compartment two and dividing them by the corresponding volume distribution. And then this, like we did before, I grab the subset that corresponds to the observed, rec observed value records. And then I go through and do all the same stuff as before with the stochastic bits here. I've got all my priors specified here. I generate the individual level, uh, where we go, level uh, parameters here. <coughs> is part of this, and here I'm dealing with the residual variability component. Uh, and then maybe just briefly in the generated quantities block. Generated quantities block, again, is largely a repeat of what we saw in the, uh, in the transform parameters block. So again, you'll see uh, I go through, I'm looping over subjects. And it's doing more or less the whole process again, and a calling that same function again, my Torsten function in here, the PK model one compartment, and generating the corresponding down here, dealing with the, uh, you know, the, the individual predictions and the population predictions. And a little bit of bullet proofing here, so I'm not doing silly things like trying to take uh, the log normal of something with a mean of zero. Log normals don't like that. Uh, and it's probably worth spending a moment on the corresponding R with this. Let's go to script. Multi come on, here we go. Boom. Okay, now. Most of this is going to look very similar to that original case that I used as kind of our template in here. So I'll skip through most of the beginning stuff in here. Uh, the data is already in pretty much a non-mem format, and because of the way I've structured Torsten, uh, you're pretty much using that almost as is. Uh, so. You know, so if you go out and take a look at that data, you'll find most of the elements in here. Uh, but then I have to, uh, in this case, well, I guess in this case, I didn't have it for, how did I do this here? I guess I, yeah, I'm trying to remember, what am I doing with the amount? Sorry, I'm trying to remember what the heck I was doing. Oh, I see, I, I didn't have some of these. So this was not a full non-mem one in this case. So I had to generate some things indirectly. I knew basically that any record that had an amount 
uh, greater than zero corresponded to a dose event. So I, so I could calculate TVID from that. Uh, similar, and similarly, I could generate, I knew that whenever I had dosing events, they were in the uh, absorption compartment for this data set. Uh, DV, I just basically threw things here, made things NAs if, uh, if EVID equals one. Uh, uh, rate, there were no rates, so I set those to zero, and I knew I was not dealing with steady state. So those I generated there. So just a little bit of bookkeeping. Okay, here's the bit for start and end. So here I got my NT, so that's just the number of rows in my data set. Uh, start I can do by basically just, I, I did, have, this was a non-MEM style data set, so I had an ID in it. Uh, so I knew that if I uh, hit an ID where, it, where it's not duplicated, that corresponded, where, sorry, if I basically picked out the first non-duplicated value of one, that told me the index of that you know, of where that person's data started. And once I have that value, it's also very easy to calculate where the end of the record is there. So it's very simple to calculate those. Uh, it gets a little messier if you allow, not, non mem allows things where you can actually have duplicate IDs, but if they're disjoint, it treats them separately. This doesn't recognize that this would mess it up and you have to do something a little more complicated there. Uh, but if they're all a truly unique IDs, this works very simply. Uh, this is also dealing with identifying the indices that corresponds to uh, observations versus data. Once you have something in a non-MEM style, this is a fairly trivial single statement also. So it's pretty easy to generate those. And of course, once you generate those, NOBS is just how many of those there are. So those are pretty simple to do. And once I've done that, then I can easily specify the data uh, structure that I'm passing to Stan. You know, N subjects and you know, NT are easy. I've already generated all my NOBS, IOBS, and that. You know, I've got all the other components uh, that are in there because they were already either they were already in the original data set or generated in that previous uh, statement I had up top. Uh, and to do C obs, I just have to subset out the DVs that correspond to observation events. So it's pretty straight ahead. So there is bookkeeping, but the bookkeeping is not very hard, let's put it that way. Um, and the rest, you know, is the same old, same old. I don't think if there's anything else new here. You know, it's the same sort of call and so on. Uh, by the way, the question before asked about uh, uh, being able to specify some, op some of the control parameters for the sampling. Uh, this is an illustration of a simple case for that. <coughs> we'll talk more about the specific one again coming up, but uh, there is, you can have, there's an, an argument to stand called control, which will take a list, and, uh, a named list, where the names correspond to different uh, different control parameters associated with the HMC algorithm. And I think, yeah, I don't think there's anything really new in the rest of it. Uh, that's boilerplate. The part that gets a little bit new that we that was actually in some of the other things, but we didn't look at, is the those two flavors of predictions. We've got sort of the individual predictions and the population predictions. Uh, it, it does uh, posterior predictive checks with respect to both of those. Uh, now, if I really wanted to make it pretty is I didn't do the full-blown things where I do the, the VPC sort of thing where I do the predictions of the population median and things, but that's fairly easy to do with this kind of data. Uh, was that my, you're telling me it's that time? Oh, 10 minutes, I say, okay. My eyes have gotten better, but they're not that good, so. You know, so I recently got a set of intraocular lenses now, some hot stuff. So much better than I was, but still not perfect. Uh, okay, so basically we've seen actually this basic structure before, but now this is doing it separately for the CEOPS cond and the CEOPS pred uh, that you have in there. So you're basically the C, the same game where I pull out the appropriate components of the 
uh, from our fit object here. I guess we didn't talk about some of the RSTAN elements. This as data frame in this case is actually an as data frame as defined in RSTAN. And it takes the fit object and from that extracts out samples and puts them in the form of a data frame where the rows correspond to the samples and the columns correspond to the different sample parameters. Uh, and so this is doing that, but then it's saying, okay, but I only want the, want the parameters that are named COPSCON in here. And the rest of this is just structuring this suitably for dealing with dplyr stuff uh, for doing the various calculations in here and getting some quantiles here. You can see I'm getting the, like a fifth and a 95th quantile as well as a median here that I use for the plots. And so, I, you know, and then do the usual ggplot bits over here uh, to generate the plots with the observed values and then adding in with here, like my genome ribbon here, adding in the, uh, the prediction intervals as part of it. And then for the uh, in population predictions, it's the same thing all over again. And just to sort of see that real quick. Uh, to live. This was PK1, wasn't it? Yeah, mo no, wrong one. There it is. Okay, so we've seen, I won't go through the R's and that. You know, you got the usual. Well, that trace marks at the Pardon? axis. Oh, the little red ones? Yes, we oh, we will talk about those. In fact, maybe this is a good point to. To just to identify that uh, this is actually identifying it, an issue that we're that uh, we're going to be talking about. Um, there's one kind of message that you should pay attention to that can crop up is the existence of so-called divergent transitions. Um, and I'll save for the subsequent bit where we talk about HMC in more detail why you're concerned about that. But basically, they mean something went off the rails. Uh, and they can rep and they can indicate an important problem that you need to deal with. And so by default, the function that I've got in there will flag where divergent transitions exist. Uh, and sometimes you'll, you can even see the pathologies. If you look real close here, you'll see for one of the chains, it came down here and something stayed stuck down here for a whole long time. Something funny was happening there. Uh, but the... Anyway, that's something that needs to be dealt with, but I, and we will talk about how you deal with it. Okay, so we got same old, same old here. We'll see if it takes a while. So, and here you get your individual predictions. Now, by default, the way I wrote this one, it only generates predictions at the points where you have events. And so for a, for a sparsely sampled thing like this, the plot is rather an unsatisfying thing. You don't really see the overall shape of the of what's happening because you only get them at those points, so they're kind of awkward looking. But you know, but they, at least you see how well you have fit to the observed data points. So the shape depends on these uh, plots. They are representing the uncertainties. Uh, they are represent. Yeah, this particular. Yeah. The, so in here, we're looking at for each in set of individual predictions it's saying how uncertain I am about predicting a new observation for that same subject. So it's reflecting, uh, well it reflects the uncertainty in the model parameters and the residual variable. And why do you include the residual? Uh, because I'm comparing it to observed data. So, okay, if, I, I guess I'm a hardcore PPC person, not a VPC person. And, a, and with a PPC, uh, you should be comparing like to like. So I have observed data, so I should compare it to predicted observed data. And predicted observed data has residual variability. You know, particularly if I'm going to try to do things like count up how many points fall outside of it, you should really include, it should be, again, like to like if it's a comparison. Uh, so now if you're simply trying to do it as if you want as a uh, maybe a potentially overly rigorous test of fit. Yeah, I mean you can sort of do it. So if something uh, badly fails with a 
<coughs> well, how do I, nah, I'll leave that. I'm going to step away from that. Uh, anyway, so normally I would, again, when I'm doing PPCs, I'm going to compare like to like. In the next book, you have better population. That one, now this one, in addition, has the uncertainty in the, uh, in the uh, individual parameter estimates. How do I put this? Uh, okay, first of all, let me step back. Again, these, oops, what did I just do here? Okay, it's being weird on me here. Let me go back to the, I think I pushed the wrong button somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah, okay. These, again, are predictions of new observations in the subjects that are, that are actually there. So these are conditioned on, on values of the individual parameters that are conditioned on what you actually observe. So it's basically like saying, okay, given the population estimates of the parameters, it's like I fit each individual separately in a sense. That's a little loose, but it's roughly the idea. Uh, so these are these reflect the uncertainty in the uh, you know in the parameter values that I've calculated for that specific individual. Uh, and whereas this is what if I if I had another individual that had in this case the same actually did I have any covariates in this? No, I didn't even I don't even think I had body weight in this one. Uh, so in this case, it's saying if I if I had a patient that I gave the same dose to and observed at the same times, what would I predict for that new patient for whom I have no other observed data? Uh, these are the how wide the predictions would be. So they're reflecting the fact that, uh, that I haven't fit anything to that individual patient's data. It's just that I'm, you know, I'm going to be much more uncertain. So I've got, so now I'm actually sampling from the inter-individual variability distribution, whereas in the other case, I've actually estimated the parameter for that individual. So I've got them, so that's where the bigger uncertainty comes in. So the bands is not the, the, the PRED number? It's similar, well, it, well, of course, PRED doesn't have a band by default. It, it's similar only in the sense that it's making a prediction for, <coughs> for the, for a population with the same covariates, you know, uh, in it, but it's, you know, but again, it's not like an iPred because it's not being conditioned. It's not doing a post hoc base like it does for iPred. The, so this, the previous one is more like an iPred where it's, you can think of it very similar to the idea of a post hoc base, you know, whereas this is saying, okay, now I'm going to make the prediction for some arbitrary individual that, that has the same fixed characteristics as these patients. It's these kinds of simulations I would use if I was doing that sort of VPC style calculation too. I would actually sample from the inter-individual variation model. I would not use the uh, uh, the post hoc Bayes estimates. Yeah, I guess that's how VPC normally works. Right. And I guess the main difference here is I would argue I would use the uncertainty in the parameters as part of that, whereas VPCs classically do not. They use the inter-individual variability, but not the uncertainty in the parameters. So there's both uh, uncertainty in parameters and the individual variability. Correct. Huh? So would it make sense to separate those two sources of variability somehow? So you have uh, your inter-individual and your residual random effects, and then you have your uncertainty sort of uh, perpendicular. Well, again, it depends what you're going to use it for. Yeah. You know, but in this case where I want to compare, you know, my simulated values that reflect my uncertainty to my observed values, it makes sense to include them all in there. But if you wanted something that was sort of tighter bounds, that would be basically like ignoring the, frankly, it'd be like ignoring the Bayesian part. You know, it would be like saying, okay, um, what, w what would be my predictions if, say, the posterior median was the value? And you could do that. Yeah, you know, I could pick like the posterior median or means and do the, the equivalent VPC. This is what you do when you have no knowledge about your next patient, which you're recruiting. In effect, yeah. And that's interesting. Right. You know, and as I say, you can now, by the way, the, you can do this, you can make it a little prettier in this. One of the things that um, 
where are we at? Yeah, we're pretty much there. I'll just make quick the. Uh, you notice in the slide I make reference to a version that illustrates doing simulations for additional concentration values. So uh, now in this case I only did it to make it look prettier, but you could use the same notion to do uh, those the style you know, sort of the VPC style calculations where you want to put in things like the, uh, the population, say population median and maybe like a 90th and a, uh, and a 10th or, or what, you know, whichever quant, you know, whichever quartile, you know, whichever quantiles you want to put in there and put the uncertainty around those things. Uh, you could do that all inside the generated quantities block. In this case, I just did it uh, so if we, we're going to go, this is the PK, the Torsten 2 version. Pull that up real quick because the only thing that changes there is the generated quantities block. Oh, but I just, duh, I'm pulling up the R I wanted to pull up the model. So i got to go back to model folder. Okay, there we go. So basically you can do a lot of stuff in generated quantities. So what I did here, bum, 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 bum. oh, okay, so well, a couple things. I actually specified some things in data. So up here in data, uh, in addition to the stuff I specified before, I specify stucks and preds on things here. And basically, these are data items to do the posterior predictions where I calculate more, I predict more observation, more, I make predictions at more times than the observed ones. So I can make nice, pretty plots you know, in here. So that's pretty easy. Here I specify uh, a data set. There's also things I could have actually, instead of specifying them in here, I could have actually done. Uh, as data, I could have actually generated them inside the uh, um, inside the transform data block too, uh, depending on how much programming you want to do inside Stan. So it's not, often you have situations like this where it's up to you: which are you more comfortable with, gener generating the stuff in R or generating it in Stan? So I think for most people, they're probably more familiar with R, and so hey, I'll just do it in R, and then I can pass it as data. Uh, and that's that's what's done here. Alternatively, I could have done a lot of those inside the stand itself. Is it uh, possible to do it now? Uh, well, when it's data, it doesn't make much difference because you're not. You, yeah, you're not. Yeah, you do it once and it's done. So the difference would be trivial. <laughs> the stuff that makes a real difference is the stuff that happens during the sampling process. Yeah. Are the plots then used to cross uh, samples? Uh, yes. Yeah, the only place I might use the um, the burn-in would not be for any predictions. It would be for things like the uh, the convergence diagnostics. That's be the only place where I would entertain doing that. Uh, okay, so I specify. Basically, I'm specifying sort of a uh, a superset. That, you know, it's like I've taken the data, but I've augmented that with a bunch more times in here. Uh, and of course, observed data doesn't the observed concentrations don't play a role in that. So that when I come down to my, uh, where does it begin here? Generated quantities block, I end up generating a bunch more values in here. Uh, so it actually looks very similar, except now, you know, I'm going to have these things where I'm going to have, you know, nt pred of them instead of nt of them in here. So and that's all I'm doing in this is just generating a superset. So it just illustrates that you know you've got some flexibility in here. Uh, so to do the population predictions I have to recalculate my predicted values and I have to do it for all the times. Actually I have to do it for both of them, don't I? Yeah actually I have to do it for both of them. Uh, because I don't have those predicted times for either case in here. And the, you know so, and the rest of it actually looks the same except that I happen to be doing it for more times. And what you get out in the end in this example you know, is a less awkward looking sort of posterior predictive plot. Let's see. 
Yeah, so you get something like that where you can actually see the whole profile as part of it. So that's the only reason for doing that. Is, you know, it's somehow a little... And the alternative would be doing it in R. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you could take the samples out and do all the simulations in R, right? But since you've already gone through the trouble yeah. of specifying the model here, it makes some sense here. And as long as you do it only in the generated quantities block, that's reasonably efficient. Uh, is a, you don't want to do it in any earlier blocks because those get run many, many more times. Uh, whereas the uh, generated quantities block only runs once per iteration, the other blocks get run you know, many, many times per iteration. What's an iteration? Uh, iteration would be the, basically the uh, uh, each, well, each overall MCMC iteration. Which is, which is actually still more than the samples. I'm trying to remember. I don't think, and about to say something I'm not absolutely certain about. Uh, I think the generated quantities block still gets done for every iteration, and not, and it. I don't think it takes thinning into account. But I'm not dead certain on that statement. I need to double check that. Uh, so the, if you're doing a lot of thinning, it may still be more efficient to do it outside of. Stan. Uh, okay. The, the times at which you sample, you are defining that in R. Say again? The, the times at which you sample for this one. For I this did it in R I, for the, uh, and it depends which sample. You mean the samples in the generated quantities for these predictions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did it in R, but I didn't have to. Uh, that I sense that they don't correspond to observed data. So they don't correspond to anything I'm calculating a likelihood for. So I could have done it inside um, either the data block or the generated quantities block. Okay, we're actually, uh, oh yeah, we're getting well into our uh, lunchtime period here. Uh, let's, uh, I don't know, what did I claim we were going to do before an hour? I guess I did. So let's uh, reconvene here. Reconvene by, I guess, one forty. Yeah. Mm -hmm.